there's a little known part of Hollywood that most people are not aware of, known as the audience test preview. The recently released book, Audienceology, reveals this for the first time. Our podcast series, Don't Kill the Messenger, brings this book to life, taking a peek behind the curtain. And now, join author and entertainment research expert, Kevin Getz. So in our industry, we have a product called CinemaScore, which is an exit poll product that gives us the uh, ratings of how audiences thought of a given movie any weekend. We also have another product that is my product called PostTrack, Screen Engine ASI. But CinemaScore has a grading system, A, A+, plus, B, C, C-, minus, whatever it may be. And in the course of CinemaScore's history, they've had 97 films with an A-plus rating. And only eight directors have made the list twice. So joining the greats of Steven Spielberg, James Cameron, Robert Zemeckis on this list twice is my guest today, George Tillman Jr. We'll talk about the movies that were on that list in a moment. But I want to mention that at the age of 25 years old, George wrote and directed his very first film in one of my favorite cities, Chicago, and it cost $150,000. $150,000. It sold for over a million dollars. So that prompted his next film, which came out two years later, which was loosely, I think, based on, on his life. And it was made for $7 million, a little bit of a change there. And it grossed over $40 million. It was called Soul Food. And this is where my path first crossed with the wonderful and talented George Tillman Jr., George, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I'm looking forward to speaking with you. Did you know that fact about the A-plus rating? No, I don't know. I didn't know that fact at all. We're always <laughs> we're always digging up interesting <laughs> facts and figures, you know. Yeah, it's really something. And I'm going to get right into this because Soul Food was a movie that I saw and was just blown away by. And I don't know how many listeners have seen it, but I urge you to see it. But don't watch the movie if you're hungry, because I literally called during the movie to see if Aunt Kizzy's back porch was still serving down the marina because I had to get some chicken and dumplings and some mac and cheese and collard greens. And it was just an extraordinary tribute to family and to food. And as a Jewish guy, we really share that culturally because mm-hmm. Jews and food are so connected. And I guess in the African-American community, that Sunday dinner and those big family dinners were so very important to the fabric of bonding and bringing people together and family together. Yeah, that was an interesting process. I remember that screening in the marina. I was definitely afraid of that screening because you mentioned a movie that an independent film that I did a couple years before. And we had a screening in Beverly Hills. And that was a <laughs> and that was a screening. Why did you say it like that? <laughs> I know. I'm like, it's this small movie at $150,000 and we screened it for this audience that was used to like movies, like big Hollywood films. And our it just didn't work out. Everything was working out till we got to the third act and audience were walking out of the movie theater. So I was always afraid of test screenings, you know what I mean, going into it. So when they told me, well, the next one's gonna be in Marina, okay? And I was like, ah, nobody's gonna show up. And then <laughs> I get out and it was like lines around the door. And that's where I started realizing the ideal of having a really great title having actors in the movie that's recognizable. But that don't really mean anything until they sit down and they watch the movie. And I was just blown away by that screening. It was one of those highlights of my life, being in Marina and really realizing what a test screening or what an audience screening can do for a movie. You know what I mean? In terms of helping. Absolutely. And people love that movie. And it scored extremely highly. The scores on that movie were, if I remember, like in the 90s, in the top two boxes, excellent and very good. And and they're echoing exactly what I'm saying. It is just this homage to food. <laughs> and uh-huh. and it was almost like, to me, it, it just solidified you as a wonderful filmmaker. The fact that you were able to get underneath it all and just kind of... Bring that sense of family, as I said, to life. 
Just extraordinary, yeah. George. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, that was definitely a process, especially after that first movie that got me into the industry, got me into an agent, got me noticed. And then they said, what's your next movie? And I was like, ah, I got to think back in film school. They always tell you, write what you know, tell what you know. And the first thing I just thought about was like, wow, I just remember these interesting Sunday dinners where all my uncles and my father would be watching the Green Bay Packers, you know, <laughs> at the time, the Packers would always lose every Sunday. And my mom and her sisters and my grandmother would just always be in, in the kitchen making food. And I was this young kid going in between the men talking about the women and the women talking about the men. And then we were just hanging. They'd brilliant, be, just know, brilliant. And there would be these sunny dinners, but everybody would show up. And I remember a lot of religious people would show up and like knock on the door and say, hey, do you know the world is going to end in 1988 on Thursday? You know, it was like all these weird people coming by, <laughs> but they're just coming to buy to really eat my grandmother's food. So I just tapped in and then I started writing the material. But over the course of the film of writing, you find out what it's really about. And it just felt like, uh, wow, when you eat family stays together. And it really just reminded me of a lot of movies that I saw just about family. And I just felt that's something that as a filmmaker, you tapped into what you know. And I think some of the films that I enjoyed that I did the most was always when I was able to tap into something, you know, emotional. You know, I, I mentioned the Jewish culture, but also so many mm -hmm. cultures bond over food. What was your favorite food, by the way, before? Uh, we well, on? my favorite food is definitely... On those Sunday, at those Sunday yeah, dinners. Yeah, always there was these things with the uh, pies, uh, sweet potato pie. Oh. Um, they don't really make them that much anymore, but I had an aunt who used to make egg pie, and everybody's like, ah, egg pie, but it was really, really good. Uh, Sake to me cake, which was a really good thing. <laughs> so I was always in the dessert. Heart area. attack on a plate. <laughs> definitely, definitely heart attack on a plate. Uh, but those were the things that I just loved, and um and I, I stuck to, and fried chicken is something I love. And I remember seeing Barry Levinson movie, Avalon, and it was about his family coming, yes. over to, coming over to America. And I was just like, his Baltimore films. And I was just like, this is, a, I knew this is something that can cross over everybody. I, I, I wasn't part of Barry Levinson family, but I understood it. It was mostly connected. So he was very important in terms of me making my film. And I remember working, I worked on that movie. I remember that. Hey, the next movie that you got that A-plus score for was The Hate You Give. Talk yes. about that. Talk about that experience. You know, that was another experience that was very emotional to me. I was actually in New York working on a, a Marvel uh, television show, which was I was doing a, a lot of TV, which really was helpful to, to be able to move fast and get to the point quick. And I was there and this book came across me. Um, I was over in Brooklyn and shooting on these stages. And I was like, I'm going to do this TV show and read this book. And so at nighttime, I would just read this book and I got halfway and very quickly. And I was very connected to this young girl who experienced the shooting of her best friend by a police officer. Mm. And I always remember that growing up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I had family members who was part of the the uprising of Martin Luther King when he was killed. And there was a lot of a lot of, um, you know, uprisings and protests of, and like, protests and. Yeah, and I remember my uncles talking about that. And one of the things was one of them was uh, was arrested. And I just remember them telling me how to talk to a police officer. What do you say? What do you don't? The difference. I grew up there very early on with my uncles and my dad. That's something you sort of taught very early on. And that first scene, um, which was in the book, is the first scene of the movie. But it was a little later in the book. I moved it up right away so the audience can understand that sometimes people who are different cultures or African-American or people of color, that's the first thing you learn is how to conduct yourself around a police officer, how to stay alive. And I just felt like that's something that felt universal that I was connected with. Again, it was just like soul food. And I just felt like I had to tell that story. And the great thing about both of those movies, both of those movies were made by presidents of women who sort of understood a little bit about it. Laura Ziskin was the person who greenlit you know, soul food. And Elizabeth Gabler was the individual at Fox 2000 who greenlit The Hate You Give with Stacey, you know, Stacey Snyder. So those were really very helpful, instrumental in, in my career. But it's all having that emotional connection. All terrific, all terrific ladies. I miss yeah. Laura. We had a yeah, very uh, close relationship. And, uh, and I really also loved her husband, Alvin Sargent. 
terrific yeah. writer. One of the greatest scripts I ever read was Ordinary People. I remember I used to use that as a way to say, this is the perfect script <laughs> if you want yes. to see structure. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> you know, exactly. you know. Talk, talk to me about your influences starting out. Like in Milwaukee, you were a young guy there and you somehow got interested in film. How did that happen? Yeah, well, you know, the most interesting thing is when I was make when I was a young kid, when I was a young kid in film, uh, the first thing uh, I watched was television. You know what I mean? And TV was the the thing for me. Um, and watching television, uh, one what'd film, you watch? What'd you watch? What'd you watch? I, it was like always these weekly shows that would be on. It was really this weird show called Elvira. Elvira used, used to play a lot of these old B movies. Yes, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like from the from the seventies or from the eighties. You know, um, but two films came across my desk, which is I remember very early on, just seeing a poster. And that was Taxi Driver. By Martin Scorsese, and then seeing Cooley High, directed by Michael Schultz, uh, who was actually a Milwaukee, Wisconsin, um, um, you know, person that lived that grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. That was made in 1975, and um, Taxi Driver was made in 1976. So those two films were the first films I saw as a teenager. So Cooley High was the first film I saw in the movie theater, and then the first VHS I had was Taxi Driver. So I showed that movie to my dad. And my dad says, next time you show me a movie like that, um, I'm going to kill you. (laughs) (laughs) You know, so that really, but those two movies influenced me, you know, as a young individual, you know what I mean? Um, And those films had something to say. What what was about, what was it about those two films that that really spoke to you? Well, Cooley High was really the first film I saw with African-Americans. In the leads. As the lead. Mm-hmm. You know, Glenn Terman was the lead in that. Um, Lawrence Hilton Jacobs from Welcome Back Carter. These were the first individuals where I felt they were had friendships and relationships that were so real like, people, not that were real people, not what yeah. we what what sort of white uh, sort of executives in Hollywood thought were at that point real people, real people. And then not till later, I saw American Graffiti later. So seeing Cooley High was the African American version of uh, American Graffiti. So that was my first experience, and I saw that in the movie theater. I remember there was a love scene that Glenn Turman finally. This is my first time seeing a love scene with African American woman and man as a young kid. I've never seen that at all, but it had so much integrity. It was a very emotional film, and that film is a classic. So when I saw that, that stuck with me. And then when Taxi Driver came, when I saw Taxi Driver. What I saw was the control of a camera. Like, wow, the camera can tell you what to do and what to see. Mm. And how to lead you. Mm. You know what I mean? So from the POV through the the rearview mirror POV of De Niro's character, Travis, you know, looking through the rear view and the POVs out the window, um, the high angle shot of the last scene. It was just like You were looking at that then? At that how old were you? Looking, how old were you then? I was, Man, I had to be about 12 years old. And you're looking at angles and sort of trying to... I'm looking at angles, man. And and writer, and I remember looking up, who wrote this? And Paul Schrader? Oh, wow. Schrader directed a movie, and he was behind all these other films. And then that was my beginning. Mm -hmm. And my another beginning, which I hate to... I'm not ashamed to say it, but my grandmother used to watch a lot of soap operas. You know what I mean? She used to watch... All My Children? Yeah, all my children. So right did away. my grandmother. All my children. Yeah. One General life to Hospital. live. Yep, General Hospital. So I remember at the end of watching General Hospital, they had the name of the studio. You can write an address. And so I sent them some information. I said, hey, I got some ideas for your plot. And they sent me, uh, said, no, no, thank you. And I said, well, can I have they sent They sent something back at least. They sent something back. Wow. And they gave me a script. And that's how I saw our first television script or any script what do you mean they gave you a script they sent me i said do you mind sending me a they script did they did. they actually sent me yeah and i wow. saw how the, the structure of these scripts were so um that was the beginning for me of seeing an actual script and then watching those two movies and that's where i felt like i wanted to be a filmmaker at that point wow and um, and, and when did you first get a camera in your hand First camera was like, had to be like around the same time, 10 years old. My dad had an eight millimeter. He let you uh, play with it, huh? 
he had me play with. He had an eight millimeter camera, which was so great for me later on with Soul Food because I was able to see how these traditions of black family, my black family, through the years of all these dinners and Thanksgiving gatherings, we used to always have these little things around Christmas time, the grab bag. You, everybody put their name in a grab bag. You shake it, and then you put your hand in there. You grab a name out, and that name is, oh, Aunt Mary. We That's call that Secret time. Santa. That's what it was, man. And then you then you gave that gift, and then someone could take the gift, and if you didn't like it, you could grab someone else. You could grab something else, <laughs> and that was that's something I couldn't get into the movie but that's something that I saw all these traditions and everything, but it was through like documenting through film, through a have, camera. Have you seen um, the Fablemans yet? Spielberg's movie? No, that's, the, I'm on the, that's on my list. Oh, you're going to, you're going to really dig it and you're going to like it because it's, um, it's, it's, it's very similar to your own story. The way wow. his, his mom and dad sort of were encouraging him and gave him that camera, you know, and he just took it and ran. And then wow. they, they didn't laugh at his dream you know they 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 encouraged him um and he was just sort of passionate about it it's such a lesson i think for every parent to you know look at their child and see what they're good at and what they're sort of gravitating towards and 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 help promote that you know yeah that is something i was really blessed with because at the time coming from milwaukee wisconsin in the early 80s you know, and telling my parents that I want to make films. Like my dad grew up and he migrated from the South and he worked his way through the steels. And then he started, was a automobile, worked in the automobile business, worked at American Motors for years. And then Chrysler, the entertainment business is the farthest thing he could ever imagine. Absolutely. In Detroit? In Milwaukee. In Milwaukee. Oh, so this is still, he's still in, and this is when you were in Milwaukee. Milwaukee in the 80s, yeah. So from all the way from the 70s to the 80s to the 90s, my dad worked in automobile business. So having your son say, I want to be in the entertainment business, a director, my dad was like, what is that? What what, what, what kind of job is that? But he was, um, he was, he just, he put his faith in me. He just, he still lead led me and nobody, everybody around in that time in Milwaukee as African-Americans going to school. I want to be a director. Who does that? Who leaves Milwaukee? Who leaves? And did you? Get out of town? And I did. I eventually left. Um, my dream was to go to NYU um, and that didn't happen. So the next step was with me was Columbia College, which was OK. Columbia College in Chicago. But the interesting thing about Columbia College, you get a camera freshman year Ooh. you make you making movies right off the bat mm -hmm. yeah uh, makes a huge difference so, doesn't it just to sort of play with it not be scared of it if you know what i mean huge difference and then right there i'm there right in chicago and right i'm in chicago i'm there and i'm seeing de niro you know make midnight run you know on the streets of chicago so i'm going from a kid who's watching taxi driver you know, in seeing Yafikado, you know what I mean? And Martin Bress directing a movie right down the street from my dorms. Oh. So so that was a changing game for me at that point, that it can really be real. Did you have really a mentor in particular? I know you had people who influenced you like Scorsese and and others, but was there was there a particular person that you remember was sort of responsible for your um, guidance, you know? Yeah, there was two people early on. There was this teacher at, at Columbia. His name was Paul Heddle. Um, he was a really great writer, director himself as an independent filmmaker. What did he teach you? He taught me Film 101, which is how to tell stories from a subjective point of view that means something to you. From a structure standpoint, what is the movie that you want to say thematically? That was the first thing is that's the only time I can really make a film or think about a film is what did I want to say internally? What is the theme? What is the major point of why we here? And what is the major point of why we here? What do every scene and what every character has to do with that thing? Mm. It's like, wow, there's an organization to storytelling, which makes sense why so, to me why some films are great and some films are just okay. 
you know, sometimes it's the execution of between the actors and your your production designer and the crew. But ultimately, you as a director has to be the the, the force of what are you trying to say? So when I look at movies like Avalon or Taxi Driver or Raging Bull. Or you know, Soul Food they, or The Hate You Give. Keep going. Yeah, those films got something to say. OK, so that was the first individual who made me realize that the second person was on Men of Honor when I got a chance to work with two of my heroes. Remember, I mentioned Taxi Driver and I mentioned um, Cooley High. Glenn Turman was the star of Cooley High and Martin, and De Niro was the star of Taxi Driver. I got a chance to work with both of them on one movie. So that was my second film. Men of Honor. Uh, Men of Honor. And my second mentor, I don't think he even knows he was a mentor to me, but it was De Niro. And that was mostly the case in post-production. How so? Uh, how so is when he saw the movie, my first version of the movie, I knew he liked the film because he was very emotional and he had tears in his eyes that he sort of covered a little bit. But I remember he was very emotional. Then he said, hey, I'm going to be in New York. Can you come out and see me in a couple of weeks? And I said, yeah, I could come out and see you. He says, can you get a tape of the movie? And I said, yeah, I knew he liked the movie. I was like, okay, why well, he wants to get the tape? And then he just... Watch the movie with me. You can cut there, here, cut down here, trim here, trim there. He was just telling me things to sort of do to the film. And it was like, wow, he's cutting down his performance. But he was letting me understand about pace, letting me understand about movement, why this scene is important. Get out there, how oh, the audience I is, need. I need know? to just break in and ask you something. It's so interesting you say that because often a director will get fall in love with a particular actor and they will just be so precious with the performance and 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 over state their welcome uh for shot after shot and i'm like you're not helping the performance you're actually hurting the performance and and de niro was as you're saying like so smart to know that it actually is the performance is serving the overall film and i yes. love that you bring that up yeah, because that was the key. That's when I have the realization. I truly believe that majority of the actors are great directors. I mean, look at Sean Penn, look at De Niro in the Bronx Tale. Like these are movies where just amazing sometimes when actors get behind the camera, especially the ones who do it more than twice. And that's what I was learning about. Wow, the filmmaking is not just about making a movie. You actually can rewrite and change the story in post-production. And that's what's something that I learned from him as a mentor and just listening to him. Less is more, you know what I mean? Keep moving. It's about the overall movie and it's about a particular scene. So that was, that was about three, four hours and talking with him um, about that post-production. So <laughs> what happened around that time was very interesting because Michael Mann was actually making Ali at that time. And he wanted to see the film because he wanted to see an actor that wasn't De Niro that was in my movie. And he was like, you mind if I see the movie because I want to check out this actor's performance? And I said, sure, long as I have about an hour of your time and I can pick your brain. I was a huge Michael Mann fan. So I go over to his office and I see how he has everything set up. It's very similar to how I borrow a lot of those things in pre-production. So I sat down with him. He says, I saw your movie. I loved it. Everything was great. I just the music. Just the music. When you go emotionally, you bring the music right with it emotionally. Have the music go the opposite way. That really hit me at that wow. point where I, I have a last minute thought about music and how I see music now. And so even though I only talk to him for an hour and I see him every now and then, and I always just say hi and say some things. Just it it was moment. just that so influential, that comment. That influential. Yeah, that comment and how to see music. And I always felt like, Oh, yeah, there's something going on emotionally. Just push it. Just go with it. No, yeah. no, no. Go the opposite. Do less, you know, or take away music. You know what I mean? Did you make the movie, the first movie? What was the name of your $150,000 movie? Uh, this is a movie called Scenes for the Soul. Scenes for the Soul. Did you yeah. raise the money for it? How'd you get it? Yeah, I, re I raised the money with my business partner, who my producer, who I work with a lot, Bob Title. We were just in Chicago at that time. Um, like I said, I really wanted to be a director early on in my life. So and as soon as you graduated, I, basically? Soon, yeah, as soon as early on in, in high school, I thought that's what I wanted. And I told myself, damn it, I'm going to be the first African-American black filmmaker in the 80s and 90s. And little did I know that Spike <laughs> Lee came out 
when she got to have it and John Singleton came out with Boys yeah. in Hood, 91. <laughs> 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 Those movies were, were amazing. So that was the beginning. Spike Lee was the beginning of that time. How do you get your movie seen? Raise your own money. And then he raised his own money through credit cards and he got it through John Pearson, this young executive independent who actually would get your movies and get it sold. So our whole thing is, where do we get our money? So we wanted a budget of $500,000 to make the movie. We couldn't get it. So let's just make it for what money we can get. That's right. And it was $150,000. And a lot of that was raised by people in the automobile business in Chicago. Who what was that? What now became GoFundMe probably was like just asking anyone you knew, right? That's what it is. Hundred a thousand dollars here, Good two thousand dollars dollars. So you just did what you could. You I just actually, did what you had to, and everyone's deferring left, right, and sideways, right? Left and right. And we sold that movie to Savoy Pictures, so everybody doubled, tripled their money at that time. How did you we, get the deal? Did you drive out to Hollywood? Like, how did you get? Yeah, to Savoy. Yeah. Yeah, we drove out to Hollywood. We had, this is something I always say, have something in your pocket. If it's not a script. A calling card. Yeah, even better a movie. Now there's no excuses. Everybody's making movies on Absolutely. You know, people used to make, people used to make, George, uh, these, um, like a trailer for the movie they wanted to make. And I said, don't make the trailer, make the movie. Make the movie. Right? Yes, make the movie. And that was the biggest calling card for us. We knew one person who knew someone at William Morris, okay, which is now WME. But William Morris at that time um, had an independent film department. So we gave that movie to that person. That person thought it was interesting. They gave it to these producers, George ja- George Jackson and Doug Henry. They I remember, yeah. Also- well, didn't they do Soul Food? No, they didn't do so for Tracy Edmonds and Babyface did so. Oh, right, right, right. Okay, um, yeah. Um, but they were um, they were hot producers at the time. They had a deal with Savoy Pictures. So when they saw the movie, it was like, let's make it happen. Savoy saw the movie, and we were just sitting around one day at WME, and one of the agents says, they probably going to ask you guys how much you want to make the movie for. And the agent says, why don't you ask for a million? We're like, what? The movie only costs $150,000. <laughs> oh, please. You know, they said, just ask for a million. And we asked for a million and Savoy Pictures bought it for a million. I couldn't even believe it. Was it Worldwide Rights? It was Worldwide Rights. And and you walked every, away with probably a couple of hundred grand yourself, right? A couple hundred, couple, couple hundred grand. Uh, I had to divide it between my business partner. It was enough to keep us going for a little while. And we were working on the movie to get it ready for to come out. And then the movie, the Savoy Pictures went out of business. Oh, I remember well. Wow. That was and, unfortunate. And, yeah, and I was like, when is the movie going to come out? And it never came out. And I was writing Soul Food for those Wait, guys. the movie to this day never came out? Never came out. It just never came not out. Not even on video? Not even on video. I hear that they lost one of their last reels of the movie somehow. Um, never came out. So you tried to get it back, I'm sure, somehow, some way. We tried to sell it, get it back, and then it just went away. And at the time, I was like, hey, guys, I'm writing the movie, Soul Food. I'm writing the next movie that you guys asked for. I never really got any response, never got any calls. They were out of business. And then next thing you know, Fox ended up buying the movie. So that's how Soul They bought it in development from the script, you mean? They bought bought it in in development, yep. Wow, 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 wow. Well, so I'm just concerned. We have to get this movie out somehow. Your first um, movie. I, I think it's good to be buried. I think so. <laughs> oh, you mean that? Do you really? Yeah, I just you know what? I can, I, I trust great. you. I trust you. I, I'm looking at your face here and you're saying to me, I'm thinking, listen to the man. Well, it had to be good enough to 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 warrant a million dollar sale. I mean, come on. And, you yeah, know, I know your uh, ta- I know your talent. And and it's like, come on, it can't be can't yeah. be all that then, bad, man. Right. And then Laura Ziskin saw it and she says, oh, yeah, you can direct. You can direct Soul Food. Let's go green light the movie. So, so she, she did. Me. She got to see she it. Saw, she got to see it and saw what I could do as a director. I love that did. about her. Yeah. Let's just take a moment. I mean, that was that she had she because you know what? She was innately a producer. And I remember calling her when she got the job at because um, she produced, you know, Pretty Woman. And I mean, so many movies, right? So many movies. And and I remember calling her and saying, hey, Laura, how's it going? And I said, how different is it? And she goes, it's not that different. I'm still selling. I'm always selling. 
And I said, what do you mean? Well, I have to sell all my scripts to the my bosses to get the green light or whatever it may be. And it, I thought that was so interesting. It always stuck with me. Yeah, she was great. And she was so monumental in my life. And at that time, she bought Men of Honor for me. Um, that script was just sitting around and it was over at Paramount. And she was like, you like this script? And I said, I do. So she bought it for me. But I sat on it for a little bit because I wanted to write my next movie. And then she said, George, you got this great script here. Why don't we just make the movie? So she greenlit Men of Honor for me. And that is where I met Elizabeth Gabler in that transition. Oh, one of my favorite uh, people on the planet is yeah. Beth. She's yeah. very dear She's, to me. Very, very dear to me. But George, um, Cuba Gooding Jr. was in that too, wasn't he? Yeah, he was in that film. Yes, he was. Who was the young actor that uh, Michael Mann wanted to see? He wanted to see Cuba for something in our See, Ali. I thought so. I was trying to throw you a Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to throw you a line. I don't know why he didn't I don't know why he didn't hire him, but I know he saw the movie and I just remember him saying, Man, De Niro's so good in this. Like I remember him saying that. He saw the film. I don't know why he didn't hire Cuba, but that's the reason he was saying the film. So since Men of Honor and where you are today, and we just rekindled our friendship when we worked on this last movie that you're doing right now called Heart of a Lion, which is the story of George Foreman's life. And it's a beautiful movie. And it's a hard question, I guess, to answer, but I'm going to go for it anyway. So from Men of Honor all the way up to today, we're talking about, I don't know, probably what, 15, 20 years almost of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What have you learned? You know, what I learned... Most of all, and a lot of times is I've been bouncing around for being a producer and other filmmakers and franchises and, and television shows. At the end of the day, when I look back, is like, man, you really have to tell the stories that you want to tell. You know what I mean? That's I really do know what you problem. mean. Just as a another compliment to you is, I mean, I knew you were a terrific director in Soul Food, obviously, but but I've seen the evolution and the sophistication of you as a director, and it's really exciting. So I wanted to know, like. What happened, whether it was your own personal, professional growth informed you to get where you are today? I think so, because there was a time when, uh, when those movies were made. So, for, I mean, it was made at a time when there wasn't a lot of African-American movies made. You know, seven was the cat that they would give you, or seven or eight. So you just have to stick with it. You know, there's a lot of things that was offered that I didn't do. Then you almost like, ah, I resent it. But I always stay kind of consistently true to like, let me try to tell the stories that I wanted to make that I feel closer to. There's a, between those movies, there's another small movie I did called The Inevitable Defeat of Mr. and Pete. Small movie. Only did that for like $4 million. I felt like I had to, to get to the basics after doing one film that I really wasn't happy with. I did it just to do an action movie, but, and I felt like- I had Hold to on, to which one was that? Well, I just felt like Faster was a movie I did at CBS Films. And at the time, I just felt like- Yeah, we, oh, man, we worked I on that together. Yeah, and it was I just a fun like, movie. It was a fun movie. It's, it's a fun movie. And it's the day. It's like, what did you have to say with it, you know, as a filmmaker? And it was an action. I wanted to do action. And I wanted to go in that road. And I still do. But you can do action. So wait, you didn't answer your own question. Yep. That's not the reason you just said it. You said, why am I doing this? Just because I wanted to do an action movie? That's not the reason that's to do not, a movie. That's not the reason to do a movie. And had a great time doing it, but I felt like, wow, I had to go back to the basis and do a four, a three, four million dollar movie. Sure. To get to and something that meant something to you, that felt that something. meant something to me. Went to Sundance, played at Sundance, came out, got great reviews. That's all I needed. Get back on the mm. bandwagon. You know what I mean? Just to get back to the basics of what oh, you mean. Oh, I do know what you mean. I have the good fortune of having one of my best friends in uh, Jenna Rollins, the great actress. And I didn't really know Jenna when she was married to John. We met right after he passed. But our, one of the things that Jenna, who's still with us, thank God she's living in Palm Springs, she said to me always, she always followed her heart. Now, she did some movies that she knew she had to pay for the movies that she and John were doing. So they would go off, make a movie for a studio, come back with some cash to put into the movie that they were making. 
but all the movies that she was passionate about had a tremendous meaning for her. And that's how she guided her career. She never cared about all that other stuff. I always yeah. admired that so much. And it sounds like yeah. you sounds like you learned that. The heart never fails you. It never fails you. And there was some things too. You go left just to go right. Let me just tell you, like Elizabeth Gabler, we and her was talking and they had a movie called The Longest Ride, right? That was a love story that was set in the role of bull riding. It's like, what? I don't really know bull riding, right? <laughs> And then my wife was telling me, like, hey, you know, it's about love. We've been together about since high school, 36 years. Maybe you can tap into it. And I tapped into it, and I really did have something connected. It's a little bit, and I love the bull riding. That was something that it was a really great experience. Really wasn't, per se, connected to me. But it was just I wanted to work with Elizabeth Gabler. I loved the bull riding. I had a really good time. But what that did was it set me up later for the next movie, which was The Hate You Give. And it was with Elizabeth. And I felt like that movie is close to my own cut as it can be. You know what I wow. mean? Just yeah. Because, because of the... But, sometimes but you I want to acknowledge also, so yeah. Soul Food was too. Yeah, Soul Food you, was too. Because when a movie has that emotional resonance, I find that I don't see that many substantive changes because no one wants to fix what's not broke. Yeah. You know what I mean? How often do you see that on your side? Not terribly often, to be honest. I see changes because, well, for different reasons. But what I'm saying is when you get a filmmaker who has such great conviction coupled with wanting to win, meaning they want the movie to be successful. So they know their heart. They trust their heart. They're fighting for their movie, which I completely respect. But yet they're not closed off to hearing what audiences have to say. And then making a cogent argument for that. But just to hold on to something for holding on to it is kind of bullshit. It's kind of bullshit. And then how often, this is what I think about as a filmmaker too, is like, wow. Like, and I say, I have about my, out of all the films I did, I say, wow, I got at least about four or five of them. Like I made about, I think I made like seven or eight movies, like uh, as a director, produced about 14 of them together. And I was like, how do a filmmaker get every single one like that? That is a question. <laughs> I don't I know. That, it doesn't, it doesn't I know. hang. I mean, well, Spielberg got that 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 resume like crazy, but it's just like. Well, you know what happens also. When you have a, a certain level of success, the choice of the material becomes so vast that it's the movie stars as well that have really with, sort of withstood the, I'm talking about Tom Hanks and Denzel and Tom Cruise. Yeah. like that level, they just get whatever they kind of want to do in a way. And and so it doesn't suck. You know, it, it makes <laughs> it makes it a lot. I think right. it makes it a lot easier when you have a plethora of choices. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But you, by yeah. the way, not to take anything away from any of them, they've earned it. Yeah. yeah. But it makes it more challenging when you've had a level of success and then you're sort of still having to work harder to get that material because it's all about the material. Yeah. Yeah. It, wouldn't you I agree with that? I totally agree with that. And I think that's the key. And, and then sometimes I think about love all filmmakers. I saw this really interesting movie. I really liked it a lot, actually. James Gray, uh, Armageddon time. I don't know if you've seen that. I haven't yet. yet. I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. yeah. It's really good. And you know, you see filmmakers who just keep plugging away and keep it, uh, yep. personal. And um, so you always learn as a filmmaker, you learn from everybody. You know what I mean? You yeah, learn. I totally do. We learned that in school because I went to an acting conservatory and they taught us don't walk out of things, go the distance, stay and learn what it's not working. I remember I used that my whole life and there was a intolerable show. It was at the uh, Amundsen or something. And I just was like, I'm too old for this shit. I can't do this anymore. I'm walking out. <laughs> I walked out during intermission. But I did. but almost always, I really try to, what can I learn here? And I really do. And I continue to. And I think the day that we, as professionals, artists, give up that ability is like, give it up. You know, that curiosity, that insatiable yeah. curiosity. I love that your wife uh, opened up your your eyes to see the possibility of that movie, you know, Hey, yeah. talk about the love is a, talk about your beautiful wife who I think is phenomenal. 
Well, it's so interesting is she's been around for a long time since I was 16 years old. We met, we were 16 years old. And how I met her was I was coming from football practice. I played football. That was my second dream before I realized I was too small and really couldn't run as fast. <laughs> <laughs> so I came up to her. I saw her walking by and I drove up to her and I just said, let me use what I have. And I said, hey, I'm George <laughs> Stoneman Jr. And I'm a director. That's what I said. Oh, of course you did. She says, well, I'm Marcia Wright and I'm an actress. That's what she said. And little did I know that she was transferring from my her school to my school, because my school at that time had a broadcasting, journalist, and writing department where sometimes you can do television and film projects. So that's why she was heading over to my school. And that started a relationship where very early on, all the way into college, she was always in my films. She's an actress, so I'm always doing read-throughs. Oh, great. She's the one that read the script, like with Soul Food and The Hate You Give. I do read-throughs of myself personally. How to really devise like my rehearsals with actors. I love rehearsals. A lot of people tell me, actors, like, ah, we don't really do any rehearsals. We just jump right Oh, in. I love rehearsals. Now, yeah. it doesn't mean you don't take out the spontaneity and get this wonderful surprises that you feel on set or you can discover on set. But still, like to be prepared and to know that you can go deeper and what your vision is, you know, why don't you think about this? Actors love being guided. They don't want to be yeah. told. They want to be guided. And so it sounds like that's what your process might be. That was my, that's the process is what I love too. I heard this quote that I love is that you never learn anything when everything's going well. You learn from a scene of a crime. So I always tell my actors, we just going to mess it up. Let's mess it up. Let's see what works and don't work. What it does is get a sense of confidence that, first of all, you're building a, per, a relationship. That's what you need, a chemistry relationship. So when you got three or four scenes to do a, a day, you know, you know, especially like a film like George Foreman, like the heart of, of you know, heart of a lion. We had four or five scenes a day. So we got to move fast. So how do you get ready, prepare for that? So you know what the alternate things that work and don't work. And your lead is phenomenal. Yeah, he did a really great job. And that was a process of working for a year and the process of doing rehearsals. And then you got a person in every scene. So he has a rehearsal with the mom, the rehearsal with the boxing, the rehearsal with his love of his two relationships. And then how do you build the intimacy between the two love relationships that he has? All that is a rehearsal. So I'm the kind of director I like to have three ideas. I, I, I did this with Men of Honor because I was so afraid with the Dero, like, oh, I don't want to do that. So I always prepare myself three blocking ideas, always have my subjective so you, verbs ready. You come in you with a shot, I mean? you come in with a shot list every day? Yeah, I come in with a shot list and then I'm ready to adjust. Gotta be ready to adjust. It's not my way. It's what is the right way? What is the organic way? But there's always a key. Some actors like to do blocking where it's comfortable for them. I always try to get them in trouble a little bit. So sometimes that organically happens with a plan. So who do I have to throw those ideas out? You know, my wife is an actress, so I can. Have oh, that's wonderful. Well, when I saw her in Chicago at our screening recently, I was so taken with her support of you and the fact that you worked so well off each other. And I just wanted to acknowledge her. Oh, thanks. Yeah. 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 It's just my good luck. She's usually around when the, those numbers come. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. I love that. George, talk to me, if you would, about the screening process for you. Like, is there a particular moment that you remember in all your movies that the audience really was kind of responsible for a big change that happened in one of your pictures? Yeah, there was one particular moment that I remember on a particular film, and it was really a film where things were just too tight, where the cut was moving very fast and trying to get through the material and trying to keep people on the edge of their seat. And I just remember the audience were just feeling like, at the, I can, you can, first of all, you can feel it in the audience. Just yeah, you connect. didn't even need you didn't even need the cards, the questionnaires. You didn't you even need the cards. Knew, yeah, didn't even need the cards, and it's just a feeling that you get. And I don't really watch back the videos to see what their faces look like. It's just a feeling, and I like to sit in the middle of the audience. And that was the time where I felt like oh, I got to slow things down. I got to get a moment to really subtextually. What is these actors trying to say? What is these characters? 
Because it was want. just adrenaline, adrenaline, but you needed the breath. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah you needed the breath. Yep, and that was and that was just because just because the audience is is a hip hop audience, or just because it's about hip hop. You know, it's just. It doesn't really matter. People want to know about characters. They want to feel like they're listening in on things. So that was a really great example. Another great example is when you know things are working, mm. you know, and that's a feeling that you just can't get over. You just oh. want to sit in it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you know? So it's always. Yeah, I always say always, it's 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 a uh, validation as much as it is an assessment. It's a validation yeah. of what your instincts have been telling you. What have you been telling me? And it's so interesting. I heard a story. I don't know. I think this is true. I heard a story that Scorsese loves the test. He loves the screen. He likes to scream, but he usually does it with his family and friends. But he is is very big into feedback. Very, very big into feedback. Always has been. And that's something over the years. I Because remember, I told you my first film was a disaster, like before Soul Food, after Soul Food. It was like night and day, you know, like standing ovation, right? And then men of honor standing ovation. So you get used to like these numbers, and and, and but then it's like now, it's, now it's like it's not to me. It's not about chasing the numbers now. It's about listening. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. That's important because the numbers are going to get there if you just listen to what they're saying. Sure. Are you excited about where things are going with our business right now? Um, yeah, I am very excited. Um, I am very, I'm trying to figure out what's the next step. I don't know what's the next step. It's like, it's, you know, so much, there's so much out there. So how do you stand out is the key for me now. Differentiation. Uh, yeah. I had a, a really good question, good conversation with Tom Rothman over at Sony. He's like, these days to go into theaters, your movie's got to be great. Can't be good. Anymore. It is a hundred percent true. I just interviewed Tom and Elizabeth for my new book which is going to come out next year. It's called How to Score in Hollywood. And it's about getting to the green light, you know, and how mm -hmm. and what that process is, right? Yeah. And Tom is a huge proponent of, of, he understands, let's just say, that the criteria used to be content is king. And then some people said distribution is king. And then marketing is king. But now we're back to content is king. And, and we both agree that, Great content is king. If you're going theatrical, that's what is going to differentiate you. A piece of advice that a friend of mine called George Tillman Jr. gave me, and I'm going to throw back to you, is just listen to your heart. Thank you. Just yeah. listen to your heart because that will create differentiation. Because to me, the three best films you've done, including Hate You Give and Men of Honor mm -hmm. and Soul Food, for me, and of course, the new movie, which I'm not allowed to really talk too much about, but it will definitely join that list. I'll just say that is the fact that they're personal, they're personal and they have meaning. And so with that, I can talk forever, but I need to let you enjoy the rest of your day. George Tillman you. Jr., you are a very special person and a terrific and talented director. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Kevin. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'll see you at the next test. <laughs> see you at the next test. All right, look forward to it. Okay, and say hi to Marcia, please. I sure will. To our listeners, I hope you enjoyed today's interview. I'm Kevin Getz. And to you, our listeners, I appreciate you being part of the movie-making process. Your opinions matter. Get a glimpse into a secret part of Hollywood that few are aware of and that filmmakers rarely talk about. In the new book, Audienceology by Kevin Getz. Each chapter is filled with never before revealed inside stories and interviews from famous studio chiefs, directors, producers, and movie stars, bringing the art and science of Audienceology into focus. Audienceology, how moviegoers shape the films we love. From Tiller Press at Simon & Schuster. Available now.